Welcome to Christ the Center, your weekly conversation of Reformed Theology. My name is Camden Busey. We are on episode number 779 by my count. I'm in Libertyville, Illinois. and happy to be back to uh, discuss some important matters. And uh, we have some friends with us today. Uh, we're, we're delighted to have two people on the same webcam, and you know what that means, at <laughs> least in terms of the history of, of Christ the Center. Usually we have with us, uh, Chad and Emily Van Dixhorn. I couldn't be happier to have them both. Uh, we'll then to do all the formal introductions in a minute, but welcome, Chad and Emily. Thanks for taking the time to join me today. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for inviting us. And they're coming from Pennsylvania in the greater Philadelphia area. Uh, Chad, of course, is professor of church history at Westminster Theological Seminary. He's also an OP minister. And uh, Emily also is a graduate from Westminster, and uh, she's a stay-at-home mom who leads and loves Bible studies and women's retreats. Not only says that on the book that we're going to talk about, but I know that firsthand because she's told me. And uh, mm -hmm. we have all sorts of books that we're not going to talk about today, but I want to mention we have Confessing the Faith. This is this is a cornucopia. It's in November, so we're going to bring a cornucopia of publications. We have the Confessing the Faith Study Guide. But wait, there's more. We have God's <laughs> Ambassadors. <laughs> and we also have the Minutes and Papers, the Westminster Assembly. I We now have a physical copy, a generous donor sent us a set. So we have this, and I've been diving into this. But uh, the Van Dixhorns have been busy, and we're excited today to talk about this one here, Gospel-Shaped Marriage, Grace for Sinners to Love Like Saints, published by Crossway 2022. Exciting. Uh, we're going to be talking about that today. I'm going to start things off. Van Dixhorn's just asking you how you how you first came to write a book on marriage. Uh, you know, that's the perfunctory question when we're talking about a book. But I think it's interesting uh, to hear the backstory, especially about this book, which is distinct. If you might uh, indulge us by explaining a bit about um, the study that this came from, but also your thoughts and desires for writing such a book. Go for it. <laughs> um, yeah, so actually a publisher approached us um, and asked us to write a book on marriage. And we said, okay. So um, we took the approach of Chad preparing Sunday school lessons on it. We yeah. worked together, but that way we could work it out with families in the church, marriages in the church. Um, and we ran through that a few times. Um, and it turned out that the format we ended up with didn't really suit that publisher and they said why don't you take it to crossway oh <laughs> interesting and this is the behind the scenes stuff now this is the yeah. behind the scenes <laughs> talk and well, i crossway think it worked said, out well <laughs> yeah crossway said this this format is just fine for our purposes sure so we're very grateful to the original um people for mm -hmm. putting us onto the topic we're very grateful to crossway yeah. for um, sure delivering it. No, this is great. I, I appreciate this. You know, and, and uh, you hear books on marriage. I'm going to speak for a large number of our of our listeners. And I'm, I'm this, this is going to lead up to a compliment. So don't get nervous. <laughs> but nor <laughs> <laughs> normally, you, especially with our group, just by, by nature of what we typically talk about week to week, you get sent or you think about a book on marriage yeah. and people are like, oh, well, I've read those before. And there tends to be uh, a formula or a commonality to them. A lot of that's good because you got to cover common bases. But then after you've read five or 10 or you're, you're doing marriage counseling or you're doing premarital counseling or just reading for your own benefit, your own personal life, in pastoral ministry, you, you end up reading a lot of these kinds of books and you start to notice that maybe not all of them need to exist because <laughs> they've been written before. And people are just changing the stories for own personal anecdotes. But this book, I want to say, is is I was so refreshed just to read this book because it had a different character to it. Obviously, you're covering a lot of the same material in terms of definitions of, of marriage, the significance of marriage, how, to, how men and women ought to relate in marriage. We'll get to that later. Um, but I truly did feel that there was this, play, this book was coming from a different place. And it isn't just your writing style, which both of you write tremendously well, but, and it, and it isn't as simple as just saying, well, it was structured differently. So it's just a matter of the chapters we decided to include. I, I haven't put my finger on it yet, but there's something in the bones of this book that felt different. I'm wondering if, uh, if anyone's n mentioned that to you or noticed that, or if that's coming from a intentional mm -hmm. place or it just turned out mm -hmm. like that. 
So, so it didn't just turn out like that. <laughs> it was Thanksgiving weekend when uh, Emily and I went for long walks and closeted ourselves in a study uh, to really think through the bones issue. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, that what what you what you see there is our our, our must do list. Mm. And uh, a couple chapters are there because Emily thought they'd be really useful, and I now see just how useful they are. Um, and so I think I think Emily was especially uh, important in kind of developing the shape mm -hmm. of of the book. Uh, and I was I was more like an initial drafter. So so her heavy emphasis, mine back to her, and it became uh, ours uh, through God. this process. And and it is a word that we get back regularly that this book really is different mm -hmm. than ones out there um in some ways that's surprising to us because this is just how we see things mm -hmm. but here it really is different and yeah. and and to, so a, a few different feeders N number one we wanted to address a lot of uh, issues that are current today without really spending a lot of time talking them so to write in a way that addresses current problems in the first page and a half we without saying it, address the problem of transgenderism, right. homosexuality, serial divorce, and uh, polygamy uh, in the first three pages, uh, the problem of cohabitation and the decline of marriage, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and you know the, the challenges involved in remarriage and so on, yeah. but without, without getting grumpy. <laughs> um, and then um, Emily really thought it important to think about marriage in terms of kind of the history of, of redemption mm -hmm. and the unfolding of God's revelation, which I, I now see as so important for kind of grounding it, not just definitions, but, but that as well. Yeah. And then our little bit of, you know, reading and re reading some Puritans uh, and one in particular also mm -hmm. gave us a diff different kind of edge or not edge, but angle. Sure. A different perspective uh, that's reinforcing a lot of the same ideas. I, I love that. I, I appreciate you explaining that to me and, and uh, opening that up, not only to me, but everyone else who's who's watching or listening. I particularly appreciate the fact that you are touching upon and addressing contemporary issues because they're really important. They're really significant. But at the same time, transcending them, or you could go the metaphor in the other direction, getting down to the root and addressing things from a biblical perspective, because then you don't end up with a book that, you know, in five years when the issues change is all of a sudden out of style or mm. inapplicable. Um, you really, in a sense, have written a book for its time, of course, but in a lot, in many ways, it's timeless. Like, who, you know, the, I don't mean to say it's, uh, this is going to be read in a thousand years. Who knows what things will be like uh, in that perspective. But my point is you're you're dealing with the 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 core issues at stake in marriage. Uh, it Which seems probably to me. reflects our own laziness that we've tried to write a book laziness. that won't need to be revived in a few years. Uh, yeah. Well, isn't that better? I mean, rather than you're not writing a a periodical, for example, or a magazine piece, it's a book, and there's something to say about that format. But um, I appreciate this because what you're providing is not just. Uh, specific lessons for specific instances, mm -hmm. but principles and tools that husbands and wives can use and counselors can use to address changing circumstances in years to come. Yeah. Yeah. That's the hope. That's the hope. Very good. So uh, let's begin, uh, you know, as we're continuing diving down maybe into more of the specific chapters mm -hmm. here, uh, you know, we start providing some basic definitions and one of those basic definitions and principles is you say on page, well, it's page 16 of the PDF. So it might not be page, it's in the ballpark of page 16 of the book. It turns out that the first thing that we should look for in a marriage is someone of the opposite sex. Good point. Uh, important. We need to do that. But um, what might you say more in terms of people as they might be, you know, pursuing marriage or looking for, what are some general guidelines that you might consider and uh, also just refreshing, are there any practical ideas, <laughs> you know, beyond just yeah. biblical qualifications? Uh, what do you even, for example, not to get too personal, but uh, what might you be, how might you be counseling your kids uh, who are getting into marriageable age, of course? 
Yeah. Well, I think humility calls us to think like this. I would, I was thinking this way too, when I was looking for a potential husband, mm -hmm. like, oh, if I need, if I need to respect this guy, I want to look for a guy who's pretty easy to respect. Yeah. If, if I'm going to submit to this guy, I want a guy who's it's pretty relatively easy to submit to. That's going to be hard, but that's what I am going to be commanded to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm going to need to be faithful to him. So hopefully I'm at least somewhat attracted to him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so these are, these are things that we need to think about. What are, what are going to be my duties? What does God word, God's word say are my duties? And then look for somebody who's going to make that easier. Yeah. Yeah. And then oh, just a little bit on the, yeah, yeah. also then in terms of trying to be attractive to him, I thought, OK, I want to be someone that will look relatively easy to lead. Um, so I'm already interested in God's word. So that's why I want to be helpful to him. So I thought of ways I could be helpful to him um, before we were married um, so that he could think, wow, she, she could be a good helper. Yeah. <laughs> I feel actually... like you put a lot more thought into this than I did. <laughs> uh, but, uh, <laughs> um, what we, I guess we do emphasize, um, you know, some, a few key questions. Is this person going to help you grow in godliness? Mm -hmm. Um, do you enjoy their company? Are they good friends? You know, you don't, you don't want to just marry a Bible study leader. You want to marry someone you enjoy hanging out with. Yeah. Are you intellectual peers? You don't have to be at exactly the same level, um, but you've got to be in the same ballpark. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we we also, you know, one of the ways we get around to the physical attraction part is asking, you know, do you love each other in every way? Mm -hmm. And has yet failed to understand what we mean by that. <laughs> um uh, but it, but it's really important. You can't just marry your best friend. You, you have to have some level of physical attraction if you're going to fulfill the full orbed uh, purposes of marriage. Yeah. So, yeah. And re regarding your question about what we tell our kids, or are we yeah. not ready there yet? Um, is that we encourage them to go on group dates? We hmm. call it so that. You're not just seeing the guy when he's on his best performance, but you're seeing how he relates to mm. other people. Um, and that's, that's a better test of what their character is like than just going out for dinner together. There's a lot of wisdom in that because, you know, you know it's easy enough to, if, with a one-on-one -on -one controllable setting to portray, uh, you know, yourself in a certain way. But if someone spends a lot of time with you, they see they can see you in a bunch of different situations and scenarios and vice versa. It's good to have a well-rounded view of someone as we're pursuing them romantically. And and then from the perspective of the guy, Emily was talking about kind of a counsel to, 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 to daughters. Um, you know, a lot of that holds true for the son, but it's, it's also the case that uh, guys turn out to, a lot of times to be a lot more boring when they're by themselves than when they're <laughs> with a group. Uh, so there is an advantage of going out as a group because you can kind of play off other people and it's actually <laughs> sure. a lot less pressurized. So that's just a purely practical yeah. point. And also, uh, if it doesn't work out, it's not so hard of a loss to yeah. move on mm. to somebody else. <laughs> How did you two meet? I know some of this. So obviously there's a bit of artificiality to my question here. But uh, <laughs> if, you don't, if you don't mind, I think I think providing well, some of that background is, is useful. And also with the perspective of a couple decades of marriage, it might be interesting – what your present selves think of your former selves and your former uh, spouse. Mm. I mean, your spouse as 20 some years ago. Well, we met at seminary. We were in classes together. Um, but pretty early on, I was actually thinking, you know, he could be a good guy for my friend. <laughs> <laughs> Why did yeah. you think that? Just thought, just you know, kind of. Sh 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 I liked my friend and I thought, here's a good guy. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. anyways, he was, he was for me. But, but um, I remember one time calling his roommate and his roommate said, oh, Chad, um, he's not here right now, but he's going to the symphony tonight and he has extra tickets. Uh, do you want to go? And I, oh, wow. I, 
Um, I, I hadn't really pictured Chad and the symphony, but I thought, sure, why not? Yeah, I'd love to. So Chad gets home. And what would your roommate say to you? So, Chad, you go into the symphony tonight with Emily. You better get some tickets. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly what i was gonna ask i said you either have a really good friend or or he's yeah. in a, inappropriately yeah. uh, signing that's, you up for for the uh, you know to giving one of your tickets away <laughs> that's the roommate that a lot of guys need yeah that's yeah, a I true wingman that. right there smart guy wow yeah shrewd yeah. shrewd hey. He he did have three roommates get engaged in a matter of eighteen months. Well, with that guy living in the house, I imagine uh, he's yeah. closing the deal. <laughs> <laughs> My goodness, that's tremendous. Well, what? How have how have things? Obviously, there's a million ways to answer this, but I mean, relative to the principles in your book and how you've learned those principles through not only biblical study but also mm. <laughs> the, the the College of Hard Knocks to a degree, I imagine. But how how have you grown through those days of, of just meeting each other and getting to know each other through the seminary education to getting to the point where you, you have a ministry together, you have five children, and writing books on a marriage? Boy, um, <laughs> let, let me start. I, I, I think by making a lot of mistakes along the way, yeah. I was really hopeful that we could have a, um, a godly, Christ-centered, thoughtful marriage and so when anything came up in the first year of marriage, I'd want to go sit down on the couch and just kind of talk it all through exhaustively. And it was exhausting, mm. uh, and counterproductive. I mean, there's a place for, there's a big place for talking through things and being deliberate and not just coasting. But, yeah. uh, oh my goodness, I just wore Emily out. It was terrible. <laughs> uh, well, I really let you. I was just. I was like, okay, love, I'm I'm just gonna go grocery shopping now. Thanks. <laughs> so eventually, I I think we figured out that space and time are needed to to work through a lot of things, not in lieu of conversation, mm -hmm. and uh, but but as as a great supplement, and we figured out that um, endlessly analyzing our relationship was less helpful than doing things together yeah. uh, especially things that focus on serving others and not simply ourselves i don't just mean like entertainment mm -hmm. all the time uh but but actually trying to be constructive in some way and and that shared purpose really drew us together and still does yeah yeah that's wise i appreciate that you do kind of live as a unit and grow together as a unit if you're both pursuing the Lord, and then uh, seeking to serve him together, you would expect that inevitably you would draw closer to one another and, and uh, have greater unity. Um, and I'll say something is that Chad has a really good sense of humor. Um, and I saw that before we got married. It's mm. one of the things that was attractive about him. And he lets me tease him in a way he, that's not disrespectful, but um, it's, it just makes it a lot more fun. <laughs> yes. Emily has a good sense of humor too. We both think uh, that being able to laugh at yourselves yeah, uh, and others giving someone else the license to do that is super helpful in a marriage. Mm -hmm. uh, and occasionally there's a little point to it, but we just have fun with it. And so it's a way we do grow together laughing along the way. Yeah. Oh, the worst thing is if you have some, like my wife doesn't understand my sense of humor at all. So this is a major problem. <laughs> I tell her frequently, and this, you know, she really needs to learn this, but I, I tell her frequently, you just don't know how funny I am. And, uh, <laughs> no, no, she's got it. We, 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 we get along just fine. But yeah, yeah, part of that is ribbing each other a little bit and um, learning each other. And it's fun. It's fun. If you take yourself too seriously, you yeah. <laughs> just in life in general, but especially in marriage, you just, it's yeah. not going to work well for you. <laughs> Part of that's because we're broken and, uh, we're, we fail. We, I, I want to get to some of these comments about especially men's failures. Sometimes husbands are just really often, they're just really stupid and make bad decisions. We'll get to that in a minute, but I wanted to set the stage for that. Uh, speaking about the fourfold estate of man, uh, clearly, you know, a lot of our listeners will know Thomas Boston worked famously in many ways to to great effect uh, developing the doctrine of man according to the 
this fourfold estate, but you cite also Augustine who spoke of uh, marriage in a similar matrix. Frequently we talk about creation, fall, redemption, consummation, but why is it important and, or at least helpful to consider marriage within this context and to understand where we are in that history of, of redemption? Yeah, let, let, let me start us off here. So uh, we credit Boston, then we credit Augustine before Boston. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, Augustine doesn't have marriage in particular in mind. Yeah. Okay. We just thought the fourfold state really comes back to some distinctions that he lays out uh, with respect to our capacity to sin. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we thought, Emily thought especially, well, that's really pretty helpful with marriage. Um, on a very basic level, it's helpful. Let me take the first two. You take the next two. I think it's really <laughs> helpful to remember that um, you know we're we're not in the garden anymore. We've married a sinner. It's very mm-hmm. basic, um, but we're not in that first state of of man uh, before the fall. Um, non passe, non peccare. Yeah. All right. We're <laughs> we're in the second. Yeah. Uh, we we live in a fallen world, but it's not just enough to think of your spouse as a sinner, and and that's why we have our subtitle. Uh, grace for sinners to love like saints. So mm-hmm. over to you for the next two, if you're game. Yeah, so now we're in this this marriage along the way where we have the Holy Spirit in us. Mm. And um, y- you could think about that in two different ways, actually. You could say, well, my spouse has the Holy Spirit in him, so he should really be doing a better job. <laughs> <laughs> but really i should think you know what actually i'm married a sinner i have the holy spirit in me i can forgive him that's what i'm called to do um or oops i messed up i'm a sinner i'm gonna ask for forgiveness mm-hmm. um, but and he can forgive me and you know thankfully that's what jesus says he has to do <laughs> So I might as well go humble myself and ask for forgiveness. I think it's helpful too to that just to underscore what you mentioned about the pilgrimage. Um, the church is recognized as uh, a body that's in its wilderness wanderings, Hebrews three and four, which is the author of Hebrews. There, of course, is is alluding to and speaking about uh, Israel being brought out of Egypt and through the wilderness being led to their rest in the promised land. Well, the church is in that stage too. That was a little cosm- uh, a little typological microcosm of mm-hmm. what the church is experiencing. But thinking of our marriages in that way is helpful in many regards because we don't need to be finished products right now. And we are going to have a lot of bumps along the way and heartbreak in a lot of places. But if we're both pursuing Christ and, and seeking after him and seeking to be faithful in all things, we would expect that husbands and wives would be able to forgive each other and recognize that their spouse isn't perfect and they aren't either. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But we're, and we're also trying to emphasize by, by thinking about our place in redemptive history that we're, we're at a time where growth really is expected and is possible. Mm-hmm. As we head towards heaven, um, uh, as, as we're kind of making our way through this pilgrimage, we ought to be seeing are looking for ways to help sinners look more like saints yeah, uh, and uh, seeing our own place in that. Yes. And we find we do that, especially by looking outwards as a couple, mm. um, which we can get to later, but that's, sure. that's pretty exciting. Yeah. I um, agree. And, you know, as, as we answer questions and uh, tell you what we're thinking, you know, what we're thinking is always about 20 steps ahead of what, of where we we actually are, uh, <laughs> of we're we're we're, lear- we're learning and working on everything we write about. Sure, yeah. Uh, there's always the in theory aspect. Yes, yes. That, to be clear, yeah. But the, then, just to finish up with the last stage, yeah. um, heaven. That's where it will be perfect. And just remembering, we are not there yet. Mm. So don't um, kind of ex- have too high of expectations for marriage in this life yeah. um, or we'll kind of end up being always disappointed. Yeah, we can't. We, yeah. That's another question I wanted to ask and a, an important point needed that we need to make. 
a mutual friend of ours, uh, Marcus Minninger, lived in your house for quite a while. <laughs> <laughs> While you weren't there, he, you knew he was there though. Um, he, <laughs> he, um, he has written an article in the mid America journal of theology a few years ago, speaking about marriage and using it as a test case for understanding cultural pursuits. His point though, was speaking about the eschatology of marriage and the whole purpose of it, because our Lord says there, we will neither be given, we won't be given in marriage. Uh, we, you know, the, the, the Pharisees try to trip him up and this question or the Sadducees, I can't remember, I think it's the Sadducees in that uh, instance, because they had question about the resurrection. They were denying the resurrection. Said, well, who's, whose uh, wife is she going to be mm-hmm. you know, yeah. in, the, in the resurrection? Thinking, well, see, this proves that the resurrection just has all sorts of problems. But he, he doesn't, you know, give them any ground, but he says, basically, well, marriage is not something that persists in the new heavens and the new earth. What then is the significance of marriage? Obviously, it's critically important, but also it's a civil ordinance, not a sacrament. You mentioned that in the book and developed that a little bit. Well, and and I'm leading the witness here, but also how is this not (laughs) how is marriage not an end in itself? Because I think we also end end up in problems when you treat our marriages, or if we're even looking to get married, and we we're thinking of that relationship as the ultimate thing. How do we address those matters faithfully? So, so we 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 do address it early on in the book, mm. even though people often treat that passage as though it's for like super saints uh, <laughs> to to think about heaven as really being the marriage between Christ and His bride. Mm. When Emily talked a moment ago about heaven being the place where there's a perfect marriage, that perfect marriage is 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 not the two of us mm-hmm. yeah. between Christ and His bride. That means just a whole bunch of things. First of all, if if you're single, it's not like you sort of permanently miss out on something for all eternity. Yeah, uh, this uh, this gift of marriage is is a gift for this time. It's not for all eternity, and there will come a day when we'll all be equally happy. Um, it's also mm-hmm. important to remember that if you're stuck in a bad marriage, right. <laughs> uh, I I highlighted that sentence. You won't be or, stuck or, with a loser uh, that you marry. <laughs> Or, or if, uh, or if your your spouse is not a believer and you yeah. are, yeah, um, you know, one isn't in that relationship. And William Carey doesn't have, need to pick his favorite of his three wives mm. uh, when when Christ is resurrected. Mm. Uh, well, excuse me, when we are resurrected mm-hmm. uh, at the last day uh, when Christ returns. Thank you. Um, uh, so it, it's it's just important on a whole bunch of kind of practical levels for us to keep this in mind. And so what's marriage for? Um, marriage is uh, for all the purposes that we mentioned in the book, but but in the kind of the big picture, God uses marriage to help sinners become more like saints, to make us better fitted to be his bride. Mm-hmm. For many of us, that's that's one of the vehicles. It's one of the paths along the way. Um, and uh, that's that's really important for those who love Christ and want to be like him. Amen. Yeah. And that involves whole life obedience, even in, you know, little tiny moments. You tend to think of uh, the big moments in life, but uh, often we find the, the need of the gospel very much in the, in the mundane. You, you include a story here called Emoji, the early morning orange juice incident. Uh, yeah. Would you uh, be kind to, enough to recall that and, and its significance yeah. here? <laughs> so, so we were talking about the importance you know, if, if we're gonna, uh, if we're gonna heed what Paul says in Ephesians about submitting to and respecting each other, that involves really knowing each other. Mm. And uh, I, I, I thought it was useful. Emily couldn't help but agree to talk about one of my faults, <laughs> which is really not studying my wife well enough. And uh, uh, so, so, about ten years into our marriage, I, I. Oh, 11 years Ooh. into our marriage. Okay. <laughs> that one year uh, makes a difference. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I asked her one morning, you know, would you like some orange juice? She said, yes. I said, would you like some ice in your orange juice? And she said, um, Chad, have you asked me that question before? And I thought, uh-oh, <laughs> uh, this is not a conventional response. Yeah. I said, yes, because I asked her that basically every morning. She said, uh, have I ever said yes? 
No, and then I said, how long have we been married? Oh, yes. How long have we been married? <laughs> oh, yes. That's when I knew things were, were seriously in trouble. Um, and, then, and then he uh, said, oh, of course. Yeah. And then I asked, have I ever said yes? And I knew what the answer was. Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, so, so we called this the early morning orange juice incident. Right. Uh, um, I just wanted a little bit of that feeling. You know, you just picture it. Somebody goes up to the bar, like they know how you like your drink. Yeah. We've been married 11 years. He right. doesn't know yet. Yeah, it's tough. He, I, yeah. I'm like, come on, let's step up the familiarity with one another. <laughs> <laughs> There's something to that too. When, and not just on that point, uh, I, you know, in those, in that specific instance, but it could be somebody gives you a gift and it's totally off base or something. And and when that comes from your spouse or even just a family member or someone you've known for a long time, and it was so off, it, there's like a, there's almost like a betrayal to it. Like what, mm -hmm. what have we been doing for all these years that, that you yes. could think that yes. something so far off, like is going to hit home with me. Either you haven't <laughs> thought about this and I don't know. care, or you don't know me at all. Yeah. So the early morning orange juice incident was not a disastrous Christmas present, but yeah. the, the sheer rapidity of the error <laughs> and the lack of attention. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, is, is, was, 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 and, and in some areas is a real issue. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Point taken. Lesson learned. That's good. I, I love those anecdotes because they often, they bring the theological lessons to light and uh, it's important to see that and uh, that's one useful way I think uh, for couples to start to think about their own incidents in life and and uh, their own particular stories and how the gospel can shine forth in those moments too and how we can all learn to be better spouses yeah. as a result yeah you mentioned uh, some Puritans that you love uh, there's a lot of good Puritans in church history a lot of them have written about marriage and one book that you mentioned is called Domestical Duties uh, mm. by, help me with the with the pronunciation, Gouge? So, we don't so know. I is it debated? I think it's Gouge. Gouge. Okay. Gouge is how it's spelled, but I think there's a misspelling that lets us know how it's spelled phonetically. I certainly appreciate that. And I, I yield all things uh in, in English spelling of the 17th century to, to you, Chad. <laughs> You've had so many hours trying to decode all these handwriting and fighting with Microsoft Word who wants to correct you all the time. Correct? Yes. Turn off autocorrect. If you yes. work with yeah. Play, you use a text edit or notepad. But uh, how does this book, Domestical Duties, how is, yeah. it, it's helpful in many places. Of course, you have the caveat that you don't you necessarily endorse everything in the book. I saw yeah. one critic in particular that didn't like you citing this book, but I think we can be nuanced enough to, to <laughs> realize there can be lessons to learn here. Um, why yeah. why include the book and what are some helpful things that uh, you found useful? So, so, um, so Guj, in his domestical duties, spends a lot of time before he gets to husbands and wives, children and parents, and uh, employer employees in uh, Ephesians 5 and into 6, he spends a lot of time uh, thinking about the prefatory command to submit to one another. Mm. Um, and, you know, you look at where that command appears, it's as important as worshiping God and so on. It's not as important as worshiping God, but it's it's in a list of duties that includes basic things like worshiping God and so on. Mm. So this is not kind of an optional extra for super spiritual Christians. Right. We need to to do this. And it's out of reverence for Christ. Yeah. So it is an expression of our worship, of mm. our reverence for Christ that mm. we submit to one another. Mm. Yeah. There's Philippians so, 2, 5 through 11, have this mind among yourselves. Yeah. The life of service. So, mm -hmm. so Googe finds it important as he's reading through these things, the, the little comment uh, in the parenting section that children are to honor their parents and the parents, fathers are singled out actually, are not to exasperate their children. Mm -hmm. So what's going on here? The child has to do the hard work of honoring and obeying 
the parent is supposed to make sure that they're making that job as easy as possible. Mm-hmm. That's why not to exasperate the child. There's a there's a look to the other's duty. Uh, there's a there's a glance at the other one's duty. So yes, there's a context for parents to say, "You need to honor me. You need to obey to obey me." But they also ought to be saying, "How can I make that easy? Am I am I presenting an obstacle in front of that child or to that child in in their pursuit of duty? How can I how can I sweeten that task?" That, he says, that he thinks is kind of an exemplification of that larger principle. And so he gives a ton of time to what it means to submit to each other Mm -hmm. um, before he gets to the unique role of the wife in submission and uh, the unique role of the husband. uh, Not not unique, the special emphasis uh, of the woman in submitting and the special emphasis as presented in in, uh, Ephesians on, on the man loving his spouse super helpful his congregation did not like it um uh all the guys thought that he was emphasizing too much the extent to which they may need to make their their wives like their their wives life easier yeah he's conceding too much ground yeah concede and 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 then the women (laughs) thought oh my goodness he's asking us to do way too much oh both sides were critical. So he creates these tables mm. in this little apologetic preface to the book saying, look, here's typical husband sense. Uh, here, here's ways in which we kind of stand on our authority and don't respect our wives and make their lives difficult. This is what it could look like. And then he does the same thing with, 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 with wives. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The chart's very helpful. And it's like, it especially in the way he's, he encourages husbands to delegate a lot of decisions to your wife um, and give give her a lot of room to, you know, you, you're you still the leader, but Guja's wife um, showed a lot of leadership in the household um, under him. Proverbs um, 31 seems to indicate that that's a good thing. Yeah. yeah. So, so I mean, if you were to kind of put the whole dynamic that we're trying to get at, so Guj gives us an insight that we that we kind well, of run with. Then the dynamic dynamic is that you think as a husband, what can I do to make it easier for Emily to yes. speak? To me? And I think, oh, what can I do to make it easier for you to love me, right. or in particular, your responsibility to look after my spiritual good? Well, how can I mm. make that easier for yeah. him? Yeah. Um, I'm going to yeah. study the Bible. I'm going to do some praying. I'm going to look after my own spiritual growth as well. Um, so, because yeah. normally I want to bless her, Camden, by saying things like, Emily, here's your duty. The Bible says so. Um, yeah, right. And it turns out to be you're you know, supposed bless- to do this. Right. It turns out to be a little less precious and special uh, than, than I think it might be. Uh, so much better to be saying, well, if I really understand her, I will begin to know what's easier and harder for her. I'll yeah. be able to think about, like, wow, well, it, it cannot be easy to be called, not just to love me, to, but, to, but to submit to me, to acknowledge my headship in the home. That right. cannot be easy given who I know I am. Sure. So how can I sweeten that task? And Guj will say radical things like he'll say don't ask your wife to do anything that she doesn't like to do and then in this parallel column he'll say to the wife be willing to do anything that he asks you yes um and that's the kind of attitude that we're trying to get for right. our own to imbue in our own selves and our own marriage to me that was uh Very there are many problem. things that are valuable here but to me that was the the nugget the greatest thing i was like so excited about in this book mm-hmm. that i took away from it it's that i've seen that in in my own life in in pastoral counseling whenever i've done marriage counseling or premarital counseling but especially even with people that have been having some difficulties in marriage mm-hmm. uh it's one thing to to counsel people that have different conceptions of what the biblical roles are supposed to be. You and we encounter that. It's even still difficult if people have the same idea, but we're kind of duties based or we mm-hmm. look at the faults in the other and say, well, you straighten yourself out and I'll straighten myself out. What 
it, it tends to be, you know, you notice those old, uh, toys you used to get, like if you went to a carnival or something, we knew them always as Chinese finger traps. I hope that's not culturally insensitive. I just talking about the origin of them, you know, those things where you put your fingers in those things and then you can't get your finger out of the, the woven tube. Well, as long as one of those fingers is pulling, you're, I would I liken that to you're demanding your spouse to you need to submit, or the wife saying you know you need to you need serve to me. me you need to love me yeah. right and do all this. As long as you're in that mode, you're never getting out of this trap. And as soon as both spouses have the mindset that Christ has demonstrated and exemplified in Philippians two five through eleven, when they give and die mm-hmm. to self and seek to serve the other, mm-hmm. then you're able to release the tension in, in a marriage way of speaking. Uh, wow. That's why I thought it was so wonderful how that infuses the whole your both of your, your whole entire conception of marriage. Because even when you're looking for a spouse, you're looking, well, what am I called to be in a marriage and to do in a marriage? Mm-hmm. What is going to be more pleasurable and, and realistic? Can I submit to this guy <laughs> and vice versa? Yeah. Can the husband love and give himself as Christ loved and gave himself for the church to this woman? Yeah. And if if those are tough questions, you're like, I don't know if I want to do that. Obviously, you, we know the spirit will work throughout our lifetimes. But the, it changes the equation immensely when we start thinking this way. And it helps us, I think, get out of some really impossible situations when we go in with a servant mindset. Yeah. And I, we had, this is the first year of our marriage when we came across this book. It mm-hmm. was not in print at the time. I decided to study the Westminster Assembly. Uh, is Cambridge Greenville. missing a copy of this book? <laughs> uh, so we got this when we still were at Westminster. And I thought, yeah. I want to start collecting books by members of the Assembly. I think this is the first book we got. Wow. We started going through it. And I thought, yeah, th- there's vocabulary in here, sometimes frameworks and assumptions that I, I don't want to pass on. And even when I've uh, reprinted that little chart at the front, mm-hmm. I've, I've always let people know. I've edited some words, dropped a few lines here and there. Yeah, But there was an insight there. Uh, I just thought, what a gift to be given in the first year of our marriage. Mm. We get to try this out for a long time now. Uh, and uh, so we, we've both been very thankful to the Lord for that. Praise God. Praise God. I I... I want to switch gears a little bit, but I'm still on the subject of a servant mentality, a servant mindset. Emily, you've alluded to something earlier in our, our conversation today, but I've been the very grateful recipient of your hospitality. I'm so tremendously thankful for being able to be in your home a couple of times. I know many, many people have the same gratitude and thankfulness for your hospitality. Um, I am try- I'm also just immensely impressed with your children's hospitality. I know that's something that you've sought to cultivate and to provide discipline on that. Um, even your youngest going above and beyond to some incidental thing I asked of her. <laughs> then I almost felt bad that she went for like 15 minutes on an, on a task and an errand just because I had some incidental thought. And I was like, wow, this is, <laughs> this is serious. I got to watch out what I ask for because she'll, she'll do it. Um, but, um, Anyway, my point is I'm trying to inculcate that in my own children as well. But speaking on this subject of hospitality, how is that such a useful test bed or test case for for marriages, to develop marriages, to encourage marriages? And and along those lines, you know, what how do you consider hospitality? What it is, but but maybe even more importantly, what it is not. Well, how hospitality is in the church it's inviting your brothers and sisters over Mm. christ and it's it's certainly not a performance though there's ways in which you want to you 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 know the um the be our guest sign from beauty uh, uh, song (laughs) and beauty and the beast like there's an excitement and you you do want to treat your guests in a special way um, but it's not a performance about us. It's yeah. just about we want to serve and we want to serve well, if we can, even yesterday it was hot dog. No, it was hamburgers. <laughs> so it can be simple, but you want to give your attention to your guest. Um, and it's a way together that we try to put others first. Mm-hmm. Um, that togetherness is important, right? 
I mean, yeah. how, how flesh that out in, in a sense, develop that thought. Why is it important that you do that together? And then by extension, also do it as a family rather than you being hospitable out and about Chad being hospitable at the seminary or out and about whatever. Obviously well, you want to be hospitable in those places too, but there's a uniqueness in the house, in the home. I will say it's tricky because I know a couple where one of the wife wants to show hospitality, but the husband doesn't. Hmm. So if I can try speaking to that a bit, it's, Please. it's it can be difficult. Um, we both had an interest in it from the start. And so that is one way in which we're different from that situation. But we could see how we could show hospitality better together mm -hmm. than we apart. Um, yeah, I, I think I think too, Camden, it, you know, for some reason, there's just aspects of hospitality, I, I just don't really get very well. And so we work better as a team. But to do this, I have to be committed to, uh, you know, doing dishes afterwards when Emily's tired, vacuuming the floor, picking up toys, used to be kids toys. Now it's more dog toys, but like being committed to, I just can't kind of waltz out of my study and greet guests at the front door. Mm, uh, yeah. It's something where we have to kind of analyze the situation, our time, our energy as a couple and work together the whole time before and after and during we're, we're we're kind of relating to one another and so it's like a multi-hour project but yeah. at, at the same time yeah we can just sort of be at a low and we just sort of know mm. we kind of need some guests over hmm. and you'll be surprised how fast we can clean up the house and also a surprise by how satisfied guests can be with frozen pizza or something very simple. Sure. So it's kind of cut away the excuses, just bring some people over and let's just, you know, it's it just in the same sense. And it's not good for man to be alone. It's not good for couples to be alone too much. Mm. Like get some people over. And then once the people are gone, I, I like to say this very much pray for your guests. So then you can say whatever happened, at least I know they're blessed because I prayed for them. <laughs> That's great. Takes That's the great. pressure off. Oh, did I say something really stupid? Oh, did I say something offensive? Oops. Yeah. You know, your That's mess always up. my thought. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I, yesterday, if I may say, Emily was in a bit of a funk in the morning. I said, we might need some guests over today. Uh, <laughs> this is the real so I have to deal with this yeah the real uh, van dixorns right here but but it you know she needs to kind of get outside her own head yeah um and uh sometimes just you know sometimes that means we need to go for a walk on a sunday afternoon that's cool mm -hmm. uh but, but sometimes we she really yeah. needs to be thinking about other people or i do and so that's that's helpful and then just to touch on what emily's said earlier we are a family, but we have, we really believe in the communion of the saints. We're all part of a bigger family. It's a real family mm. with a real father. Um, and so um, we want to think about the fact, we want to think about how, how, how when we start a new family, are we not deserting, but that rather leaning into that larger family? Mm. Yeah. So I think we've all known the experience of a couple of people pairing up and like, you don't really get to see them anymore. Or now you're like, well, I'm single, they're married, so I'm not part of their group anymore. And so no. we, we want to consciously um, work against that as God gives opportunity. And hmm. that, yeah, that does happen. That does. But, 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 but hospitality is only an example. The, the larger point is that there are ways that we can serve, serve together, our, serve together the Christian community, our larger community, that a, that a marriage yeah. is not a place for just us two. Yeah. It's not a better dating arrangement. Uh, <laughs> oh, it is. <laughs> although it is, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. For the future readers, know that there is really helpful, wonderful material on sexual intimacy. Speaking about it from a biblical perspective, often the problems in the bedroom you mentioned are not 
They don't start there and they don't end there. Uh, they're wider conceptions. But uh, thinking, if you'd like to comment on that, that's fine as well. But if, but thinking more broadly, I'm also just wondering if there are any other areas of exploration or other items that might be worth discussing relative to the bigger picture of of uh, how we can be more Christ-like in our marriages and, and comments or exhortations uh, for us in pursuing Christ even as we pursue being a better spouse to the one to whom we're married. I think one of the challenges in, in many marriages relating to, to family, mm. uh, not just your own children, but the extended family. Sure. So we do, we do uh, spend some time thinking about how, how marriage alters that relationship. Um, and, and yet how we can continue in a different stage of life to be honoring parents and others uh, and extended family. It's been really important for us when we have, we don't live near either set of parents uh, most mm. of the time. So we get kind of big doses. Uh, we live with them or they live with us or something like that. We're vacation together. N never kind of, there's, there's no opportunity to kind of spend a little time withdraw, spend a little time withdraw. So that's made us more prayerful before we're going to spend time with relatives just having a, a week or more of intentional prayer. Lord, help them to know that we love them, care for them, help us to work well together, and so on. Um, and uh, just when you think you've sort of got that all sorted out, something happens. You know, maybe maybe a parent dies. Yeah. And all of a sudden, you have a new and complicated relationship with the, um, with the one who's left. And... Uh, you sometimes you almost need to kind of relearn how to relate to that parent again. Um, and then we also write a little bit about children, how uh, it's not a parenting book, but we, we do think a bit about parenting priorities and the relationship, the priority of the marriage relationship over the parent child relationship. Um, and if I may say again, there's differences that come up with parenting. But mm -hmm. that's it's a real difficult area. Mm -hmm. um, but to for me to focus not on being critical of him, but saying, OK, how can I help him be a better dad? How can I help him fulfill his duty as a dad? Like, that's my role as a wife. Um, mm. You get the idea. That's good. That's wonderful. What are your obviously this book's been out for a few months. I'm really thankful for that. I'm sure you've you've received a lot of encouragement. I hope you have. I want to provide my own encouragement to that list. I hope I'm not the first. But um what are what are your thoughts on the not only the reception of the book, but bigger picture? What are your prayers and your hopes for this volume? As people might go out and pick it up, uh what are you hoping that they would learn or how might they be blessed by the book by God's grace? Well, let me let me start by saying um, even in writing it, I've just been really conscious of the need to um, to be before the throne of grace more than ever. Um, we have many reasons to seek happiness and purity and usefulness, uh, faithfulness in marriage. But wow, now we've got one more. Mm. Uh, the, the the temptations that Satan can bring our way. I think are increased. Um, we don't really fancy ourselves to be marriage experts. Um, we weren't planning on writing a book on yeah, marriage. Right. Came to us. Uh, we're still not marriage experts. We're just, you know, a married couple that wrote a book on marriage, but we do feel like <laughs> Satan uh, is all the more eager to tempt us. It would serve his purpose as well. If, uh, if we started, you know, snapping at one another being grouchy, drifting apart, being careless, anything like that. So I, I think, you know, doubling down in prayers that God will make us faithful mm. to him first. And then that from that faithfulness will flow a, a life of uh, faithfulness towards one another. Mm. Uh, so uh, self-consciousness about, about temptation and warfare. Yeah. Um, my interest is, in the gospel and that people can see marriage as a context in which they can um, show the basics of the gospel of asking forgiveness and giving forgiveness and looking to Christ the whole time. 
um, there's a lot of that that happens and that's the way we grow in Christ. So there we go. Yeah, that's wonderful. I certainly have grown in Christ uh, just by reading this book and I hope to uh, soon uh, give a, this copy to my wife so that she can she can do what she's she supposed to. She can grow in Christ too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good move, Camden. No, no, no. Yeah. Uh, truly, though, this is a wonderful book. I mean, um, it's distinct. I really want the readers and listeners, or uh, I should say the listeners and viewers of this program to understand that. As you read this book, it's different. It's different in a good way, not because it's a total departure from uh, a received tradition on this subject, but it's a, it's a fresh approach, a useful approach, and just one that's just very common sense and uh, even the humor that's in the book is refreshing to a degree because you realize it just cuts the tension in places where where couples might be struggling uh, and it helps it's called gospel shaped marriage grace for sinners to love like saints by our guests today chad and emily van dixhorn thanks so much for joining us you two i hope you write some more books and come back in the future thanks camden thanks yeah. brothers and Great. also check out these of course the other books you can we'll have links to these in the episode description confessing the faith if you're looking uh, for a reader's guide in the westminster confession the study guide's tremendous emily wrote this study guide this book's pretty good too really good <laughs> uh the one that chad wrote and then um other materials on the westminster assembly really really thankful uh we'll have links to everything in the episode description uh, people can find out about what we're doing in terms of our courses our publications our upcoming events all at reformedforum.org. But I do want to thank everybody for listening. We hope you join us again next time on Christ the Center.